Arsum the Bard, Part 5 Staring into the eyes of the fox, Arsum unsheathed the bound dagger of Quran from his belt. The fury that swelled in his chest proved taxing, but the second she turned her back to him, he lost all notion of having any chance of defeating these two. What chance did a boy have against two monsters? A trained tabaxi warband fell within a few minutes. What hope did he really have? The despair coursed through his veins and a final look at Lilin, his childhood friend now reduced to a sad shape lining the wall, only confirmed what this organization was willing to do. He turned towards Wilhelm, still thoroughly restrained. The once proud eyes of the seasoned warrior now ring hollow with exhaustion and the unmistakable aura of defeat. Arsum slowly walked towards the two of them, his shoulders slack and his heart heavy. When he stopped in front of them, he could hear the faint cackle of the fox behind him. He chanced a glance and looked over his shoulder to see she had pulled one of the recliners to the middle of the floor, and then made herself comfortable by throwing her legs over one of the arms. The bear man didn't seem to acknowledge him. There was some kind of grim resolve and respect that seemed to emanate around his demeanor. A long gasp split Wilhelm's plate, exposing a portion of his well-muscled abdomen. Arsum looked up to Wilhelm, a fresh tear starting down his cheek. I'm sorry. Wilhelm gave a faint smile to him. The words, protect lean barely escaped his mouth before air was choked from him again. Arsum closed his eyes and thrust forth the blade. It slid in with ease. Visions flashed of the orc woman from before, the one who had impaled herself upon his blade. His legs buckled beneath him, and he collapsed to the floor, the little life he had left draining from him in an instant. There was a sickening crunch, and the body of Wilhelm fell beside him, his neck turned the improper direction. Before long, Arsum felt himself being dragged along the floor. He was no more than a plaything, a husk. Useless. The foxwoman had said something to him, but every word they spoke only glanced over him. Again, he was dragged and eventually found himself in a cell, very similar to his first encounter with the organization. Willen couldn't save him this time. No, this time he had truly lost everything. Minutes turned to hours, and hours to days, days to weeks. Even getting up to use the bathroom became a difficult task, as he began to atrophy, mentally and physically. His only company were the rats, grazing the cell, occasionally biting into him, and a small woman who wore a cat mask and brought him his meals. They were no more than a small bit of meat, bread, and some kind of cloudy liquid that tasted awful, but was his only means to quench his thirst. When he tried refusing them, her hands would graze his face and a warm sensation would overcome him. It was the only pleasure he felt in this hell of his own making. Every once in a while she would give him candies or broken bits of sweet bread. He had tried speaking to her once, but she would never return even an utterance. He found that offering a small sacrifice to the rats from the bread roll that occasioned his meals kept them at bay from eating him alive, and the pack seemed to oblige save a few stragglers who would usually be attacked by their own kin. He had forgotten to save the morsels a day and had been swarmed the second he had tried to sleep. The bites wouldn't stop, and he felt he'd surely been eaten alive should a shrill whistle not have broken the cacophony of skittering feet and yelps of pain. The cat-masked woman threw crumbs into the cell to appease the pack. Time passed, and the creatures became more and more comfortable. They even played with him. He started to enjoy his time with them, and more food was brought to him each day. One day a veritable banquet was brought in, all sorts of delicious foods. All of his friends had gathered around him, snooting about for morsels and hopping onto his plate to indulge with him. A smile crossed his face as he bit into a leg of chicken. The cat masked woman had brought better tasting water and everything seemed okay. Only this time, the cat masked woman didn't leave. She just stood in front of him and then reached out to touch his face. Her hands always brought him pleasure. Another woman in a fox mask was standing outside the cell, looking upon the two of them. She had the coolest looking daggers, he thought. The hand rescinded from his head and went towards the mask. As her face was revealed, Arsum couldn't help but chuckle. Why dress up as a cat when you're already a cat? Chapter Break Eileen Please don't cry. You're very lovely, and we're really happy you always bring us food. Eileen felt her face grow damp as Arsum continued on. A cackle from outside the cell only furthered the despair of her friend completely forgetting her. It had been two long years since their capture, and she saw the Arsum she once loved, the very same one that 
had saved her from the goblins so long ago wither into this frazzled, rat-loving thing in front of her. It looks like your job is done. Eileen reached out to take Arsum's hand. You're holding up your end of the bargain. We can go now, right? The foxwoman cackled again. Of course, assuming he wants to leave. She pulled out his arm, but he looked up at her in confusion. I I'm eating. Where are you trying to take me? He didn't appear to want to leave before his meal had been finished. She couldn't help but feel revulsed, watching him and the rodents pick the contents clean. When he had finished, he looked up at her and smiled, said he was ready. They were led up some stairs and eventually came to a field covered in sunflowers. Eileen noticed that Arsum's hand instinctually covered his face, and he let out a bit of protest as she tugged on his tattered clothes to keep him moving away from this place. Rats had poured into the field behind them and seemed to constantly watch over the two of them. They hadn't been a hundred yards away when a bear-masked man bent down next to a large tree and set a full-grown hound on the ground next to it. It was very thin, and its fur was in patches. It's Blink! She had said, and the dog charged forward and went to leap onto Arsum, recognizing him at once, despite his much degraded appearance. Arsum flinched seeing the dog charge forward, and a loud yelp erupted as a swarm of rats intercepted it mid-air, a few feet before him. They voraciously tore at it. The hound teleported away and snapped at a few, but the second he reappeared, droves more leapt onto him and began feeding again. Blink retreated back into the wooded area twenty yards out. Eileen gestured for Arsum to stay and ran after him. She didn't need to go far. He was leaning heavily on a fallen tree for support. A cursory glance told her all she needed to know. Slowly, she walked forward, holding a hand out to try and comfort him in his final moment. Blink snapped violently at her and tried to face forward only to have his front legs give out and collapse. The wetness in his eyes bore the mark of betrayal. A quick minute replaced that with the look of a truly dying animal. She walked forward and drew Blink's head into her lap as a cascade of tears once more flooded her face. Arsum came not long after his passing. He understood the situation well enough, even though he hadn't the slightest idea who these two were. I'm sorry my friends did this. They seemed to respond to my emotions. Eileen drew in a long breath. Arsum, we're your friends, not those rats, and especially not those people in the mask. Her watery eyes had been replaced with a look of loathing. Can you imagine what he must have gone through? What I went through? They didn't want us, Arsum. It was for you. I could have left, but they said they'd kill you if I didn't stay. I couldn't. No. I wouldn't leave you behind. Arsum gave her a blank stare as if he wasn't able to register the emotion she was giving. The rats had been growing more agitated by the second. She could see them in the nooks of the trees or the shadows that they had given off. What about Lilla and Arsum? What about her? Did you forget her too? Arsum paused a bit, a look of confusion turning to one of deep contemplation. The name seemed to register somehow. Lillan deserved better than to be forgotten like this. She was so much more to you. Arsum's hand went up to his face, his brow furrowed and his face flushed red. Shut up. I don't know who that is. The rats had begun running around, Arsum's feet in response to his lash out. They were on the verge of attacking, but calmed as Arsum turned and walked back into the clearing out of sight. Eileen decided the best thing she could do would be to bury her companion. I'm so sorry, she said, giving him one final hug before lowering him down into a small pit she had managed to dig. Nightfall came quickly, and she gathered kindling to build a fire. She knew how to start a fire with flint, but wasn't prepared for this journey. She set up two sticks in a sort of T formation and tried creating enough friction to spark some heat. After about twenty minutes, she had quickly given up hope and decided just to pull the remnants of her cloak over her. Chittering roused her broken sleep. There were rats all around her. She could hear them. Hey. A familiar voice turned her around to see Arsum. He crouched down and a familiar ember lit the flame of the kindling. We brought some meat. There were laces of an apology in his tone. Listen, well, I... I want to believe you. I, I want to remember, but the only thing I can truly remember are my times with these little guys. Everything else feels as if it were all some kind of dream. The kind that always extends the reach of your grasp. I'm sorry Blink is dead. And I'm sorry you suffered for my sake. 
I must have been a lucky person to have had so many friends willing to do something like that for me. He had begun butchering the meat. Many of the bits of skin, organs that wouldn't be used, were quickly consumed by the hungry rats surrounding them. The pack always feeds. Arson muttered to himself while deliberately cutting pieces and throwing them. Arson walked over after a moment longer. Sitting next to Aline, he produced a few pieces of meat and two fairly suitable skewers. Come on, best we keep the pack's strength up. Hip's lips turned into a genuine smile as he offered up the morsels. Eileen felt her stomach turning and accepted. I don't want to be part of any rack pack, Arsom. I want my friend back. Her words fell on deaf ears as Arsom cheerfully ate next to her, oblivious to the world around him. She thought she saw the woman with the fox mask looking down on them from a tree branch, but by the time she had blinked, the monster had gone. Once again, her sleep proved quite uncomfortable. It felt like hundreds of eyes watched over her constantly. Whether it was the rats, that fox woman, or maybe even both, she couldn't be sure. Chapter Break Arsom Sitting next to the snow-colored tabaxi, Arsom's mind left him in a deep contemplation. He felt comfortable around her. She was surely part of the pack. He couldn't help but wonder about her words earlier. The name Lillen had made his chest ache for some reason, but every time he thought about it, the truth only seemed to move further and further away. Lighting the fire felt so natural to him. Where had he learned to do that? The meat had been excellent, so at least there was that. Meat in his pack, what else could he ask for? The tabaxi had curled in on herself next to the fire to lay down, and Arson decided he should probably do the same. He closed in next to her, causing her to flinch, but a reassuring hand calmed her, and soon a hundred rats had curled around and blanketed the two of them. Morning came, and they were gifted another boar from the pack. They were proficient hunters, their many eyes and ears found prey easily, and their strength saw to its capture. The cat took to butchering their meals this time. With a bit of apprehension, she threw bits to the rats as he had done the night before. He walked over and knelt beside her as she continued the task. You're very skilled. May I ask your name once more? She stopped and looked into his eyes. Eileen. It's Eileen. It almost seemed she was choking back tears. He scolded himself for upsetting her. Eileen, I'm happy to have you in my pack. He did his best to give the biggest friendly a smile he could manage. A quick look of revulsion passed her face and she went back to preparing the meat. They ate and set off forward. Eileen appeared to have ascertained their location and was leading them somewhere, although he had no idea where. Eileen, where exactly are we going? Arsom had said, struggling a bit to keep up with her quick pace. She stopped and turned towards him. Home. She picked up her pace once more, but an arm had impeded him from following after her. It was the curious woman with the fox mask. Little Arsom, haven't you had enough playtime yet? She twirled her fingers through her now long red hair. We're your family. You can't keep us waiting forever. Arsom looked into the green eyes set behind the mask. She was a predator too. He could feel it. I'm going with Aline. She's my pack. A wrestling behind him drew his attention and that instant she was gone. Come on, Arsom. We still have a ways ahead of us. If I'm right, we can catch the carnival in two days. It should just be outside of Gullet Cove. Hopefully my mother can fix your addled mind. Her words stung a little. He was sensible enough, just a little lost about his past. The journey took them only another day, and they arrived at a plethora of tents the next night. The place had been bustling, and the scents wafting through the air brought a great sense of pleasure to him. Eileen took off full sprint, a look of longing painted on her face. Arsom followed behind, when she suddenly stopped a few yards away and turned. Your rats... They'll cause a commotion. Can you make them stay here? She was looking intently at him. Leave his pack? Never. No need to worry. The pack is only visible when they desire it. Arson went to his knees and placed his hands over his eyes, as if to count. He had done this many times before to play hide-and-seek with his friends. Quickly they scurried into every pocket of the night. They'll hide and follow until I tell them otherwise. Chapter Break Eileen. Eileen looked over the ground a moment longer and then met Arsom's gaze. She gave a nod of approval and the two of them continued into the carnival. 
they made their way to the main tent where the grand show was about to start. Magical globes of light danced around the inside of the red and orange tent, and a large sand pit stood in its center with a high-rise trapeze. Her sisters had already begun their opening act. They were pretty good, but never as good as her. She made a cursory glance at her tail that had been cut when the goblins managed to catch her. The wound had healed over a long ago, but her sense of balance had never been the same. She looked back at her sisters flying through the air. Well, maybe now they were. They stopped just about halfway down the columns. If they hadn't changed the act, her father should be coming out soon. To her surprise, it wasn't her father, but her mother who came out. She still favored her fine silks and made a voice that boomed over the crowd. Welcome, welcome, dear citizens of Gulletkov. Her eyes scanned back and forth with a wave of her arms, but stopped as she caught sight of a snow-colored cat, the very same kind that reminded her of how she looked when she was a kitten. Eileen? Her voice cracked, and the tent grew abhorrently silent. One of her sisters quickly dismounted and ran to her mother's side, who pointed off in their direction. The crowd looked back, and some were already staring at them in the aisles. Eileen pulled Arson by the hand, and they started their way down. Giselle and Lana had taken over for their mother, and the three of them made their way out of the performance area. Her mother had squeezed her so tightly that she thought she might pop. Where have you been all this time, child? Where? Her eyes were already welling up. They took us, Mom. The masked people. Seeing her mother being overwhelmed only amplified the feelings that started pouring forth from her. Arsum was taken to a changing room, and Eileen went with her mother to tell her about everything that had happened. So you're telling me a mind ailment has been placed on the boy? Esmeralda pawed her chin and looked down at the crystal ball. She often gazed into it when reaching into her thoughts for a solution. She was the smartest woman Eileen had ever known, and if anyone could save him, it was her. Bring him to me, Eileen. She made her way out. The performances were coming to a close. Gustan caught six knives from the air perfectly and threw them into a wheel where Selrev fastened tightly to it. It wasn't anything she couldn't manage, until of course he pulled out his blindfold and threw a perfect grouping to match each position of the original throws. Her lips twisted up. Show off. Arsum sat in the middle of the room, dressed in fine garb, a bit too large for his now malnourished frame. It was her father's. A small blush found her cheeks. He was playing with three rats that were performing small tricks for him. One stood on its hind legs and hopped vertically forward in short succession. Arsum, mother wants to have a look at you. Are you ready? Arsum looked back at her and gave a wave before standing and placing his hands in front of his face once more, cueing his friends to the shadows. They made their way back to her mother and Esmeralda looked at them as they entered. You've lost quite a bit of weight. You were thin before, but now... Arson gave a smile to her. Come, she said and placed her thumbs and forefingers around his noggin. If it is magic, then it is far more powerful than anything I've seen. You mentioned some kind of cloudy liquid, Eileen? Perhaps this is the result of some kind of poison. Eileen placed both hands on her chest. Could this have been her fault? The food and drink she brought him intentionally drugged to erase his memory? I can see fragments in here, but there is a strong murk that interrupts the pathways. An hour passed before Esmeralda stopped her prodding. Come, it's best we eat and have some rest. Maybe I can think of something by tomorrow. They made their way to the tents where most of the workers had lived. A large purple one was the feasting hall that they would gather at at the end of the day to have meals together. Most of the room went silent as she entered, and then a cacophony of welcome back and other greetings filled the room. They made their way to the head of the table where her father would usually sit. Everyone took their usual place save the empty space for her father. Where is father? Esmeralda gave a look with a bit of avoidance. He went to look for you a week after Wilhelm didn't return. When he came back and told us about the bodies, he gathered a small warband and went off to search for you. We were told to keep moving if he didn't return in a month, and he would catch up. Just stick to the route. Her voice cracked a bit, and she bit back something hard to swallow before giving a smile back to her daughter. Arsum was given an extra chair and sat next to Eileen. The air was tense for a moment, but was broken up when her sister's eyes passed back and forth between the two of them. 
Lana gave a coy smile. She felt her face flush a bit under the scrutiny. Someone cleans up well, she said with a small giggle. Arson paid no attention as he stuffed his face with the fine meats and dishes set before them. Unfortunately, eyes of wonder and enjoyment weren't the only things present at the table. Yunti, captain of the security force for their band, stared daggers at Arsum. It was clear there was something malicious behind them. Her sisters continued poking fun at them, and her mother even got a shot in before all was said and done. They all retired, and the final joke about Aline having to share her space with Arsum made her skin flush once more. Arsum turned with a smile. We are a pack, and grabbed Aline's hand without hesitation. She felt as if she were an inferno by this point, and her sisters and mother laughed heartily at the two of them. Thankfully, Arson was given his own space, as there were still a few vacancies given the loss of Wilhelm and many other warriors who went to her rescue. Chapter Break Arson. He failed to see the joke, but laughed along with everyone even though Aline seemed to be gripping him a bit too tightly for comfort. He was led to a small bedchamber, and the rest of them departed. Good night, Aline had said, and he returned the gesture before crawling into bed. He was having the most wonderful dream. Aline and him had been playing circus with his assortment of friends and had just managed to get one of them to do a flip off of a small swing. A yell of pain interrupted him. It was Yunti standing over him, a dagger at his feet and a rat clinging to his wrist. He shook it off only to be swarmed by dozens more. His yells were loud and before long three others were at the entrance to his room. A veritable skeleton of Yunti, all of what remained. What's going on? You killed him, didn't you? Arsum raised his hand's implication. I've only just awakened. They must have intended to harm me. One of the men at the door drew his blades. Oh, I'm sure. And as he stepped into the room, the rats swarmed him. And another one came through and quickly chanted a wave of fire that cooked some of his rodents. Arsum reached for the dagger and cut into the thick tent wall beside him. He ran as quickly as his legs would carry him, much of his pack following him, and some of them staying behind to rout his pursuers. He made it to the forest once more, and doubled over attempting to catch his breath. A hand found his shoulder and he flinched. It was the fox woman, her long red hair now hung in curls beside her. I remember when you were just a baby. How I held you and Jonathan pleaded with me to have one of our own. Cassandra ran off, left us. And here everything came full circle. All because of some mob claiming a village of cannibals harbored some renowned healer and a half-drow boy. We are your family. Cassandra, he knew that name, but from where? Had she really known him? Been a part of his life? I Eileen said these were monsters who caged him, but he didn't remember being in there against his will. It was just the only life he ever knew. What's there to think about, Arsum? They tried to kill you, and because of that you killed them. They will never accept you now. We've always accepted you, though. We are your pack, Arsum. Come home. Arsum's eyes felt hot at these words. A familiar voice called out. Eileen had come, the rodents recognizing her as one of their own. Please, Arsum, don't go with her. We can figure this out. I saw Yunti earlier. He had a, a look of malice. I'll vouch for you. Please. Eileen's words were broken up, choking back by the emotion that was overcoming her. Please, it wasn't your fault. Arsum is now faced with a decision of conflict. You must decide what path he takes. Option 1. Despite almost being killed by Yunti, the captain of the guard, Eileen pleads with him to go back to the caravan. She'll vouch for him and smooth over the very unfortunate events that have taken place. Option 2. The fox woman has reemerged and assures Arsum that they are his true family and offer him sanctuary claiming it impossible for him to go back, especially after killing two members of their carnival. Option 3. Going back seems a far shot for a good idea. Eileen is part of the pack. She could come with him. They could grow stronger together, continue to strengthen the pack. Let's write a story. Let's play a game. Without the dice. <laughs>